Haven't you met my alter ego? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> you gotta keep them up. Keep them on. Keep them on. We're talking about two serious issues today with my <laughs> class, but I will. <laughs> that's, that's great. Would you mind put his mask on? <laughs> Take a shot off. Spider Man, by the way. I love it. Okay. Oh, my glasses. My real glasses. It's too long, I took them off. So, okay, so we've been joined by Councilmember Mr. Rodney Williams. To Menchaca, Gibson, Donovan Richard, Dr. Barron, Don, uh, Danny Grum, and Espinal. So, good afternoon. The City Council will begin today by voting on multiple land use items, including the rezoning of the Pfizer sites in Williamsburg and part of Linden Boulevard in East New York. We will also be voting on Introduction 1685, sponsored by Councilmember Margaret Chen which would authorize certain city entities, including mayoral agencies and the Land Use Committee of the Council to file an application for a zoning text amendment without following the DCP pre-application rules. Uh, I don't think Council Member Chin is here, and Council Member Barron, were you gonna speak to this issue as well? Uh, and we also had Steve Levin on this bill, but we'll, I'll go with Council Member Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm so excited about the rezoning bill that's being introduced today to be voted on by my colleagues. It's a rezoning, many of you know that I was opposed to the rezoning in the other section of East New York, but this is a rezoning bill that respects the community and is reflective of the people who live there and of what their wishes are, so I'm very much in favor of it. It's property that will be rezoned to have a height of five to nine, on the back side, which faces where homes already exist, and of nine to 12 on the front side. And it has a setback so that the street wall only appears to be nine stories. Most importantly, the rents are affordable to the people who presently live in that community. There's 10% set aside for the homeless. It's my opinion that if we address the homeless crisis, we address it by giving them permanent housing. I don't think that shelters are the way to do, the way to go for people who are in the homeless situation. So it's 10% for the homeless, 10% at 27% of the AMI, which is about $25,000, 10% at 37%, which is about $32,000, 10% at 40%, which is about $40,000, and 10% at 60%, which is about $50,000. So 75% actually, is for people who are $60,000 income or less. There's only 25% of these apartments that will be rented at 80% of the AMI, which is about $66,000. So it addresses my community. It gives those persons who've lived there and not had the opportunity to have full services an opportunity to now live in a nice, pleasant, <coughs> modern place and to have the opportunity to benefit from that. The developer will also provide up to 200 parking spaces because it was an issue by the community. And 40% of the apartments will be affordable at those rates or the rates that are set by HUD into perpetuity, which is critical for me. And another 40% will have 35 to 60 years of protection. So it's a bill that I'm very proud to be sponsoring and supporting and I ask all of my colleagues to join. Additionally, the developer has set a goal of 40% MWBEs, 40%, which again exceeds what it is that is usually in these cases. So thank you very much, and I hope that all of my colleagues will vote for this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. All right, we're, um, for the third time this year, the council will be voting on the co-naming of 70 thoroughfares and public spaces, uh, public places based on the request of council members whose districts include the location. This round of co-namings includes the sites for former assembly members Dennis Butler, Yvonne Lafayette, Barbara Clark, and Geraldine Daniels, and five sites co-named for first responders whose deaths were traced to 9-11 related illnesses. Regarding city schools, the council will be voting on introduction 1638A, sponsored by council members Ben Kalos and Danny Drum, which would require the Department of Education to annually submit a report on the status of gay, straight, or gender sexuality alliances, or GSAs, in DOE middle and high schools. 
the number of teachers and administrators who have received trainings related to supporting LGBTQ and gender nonconforming students, and a narrative description of the training offered by the department, including training related to GSAs. And introduction 773B, also sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, which would require the DOE to submit a report including data related to meals served by the DOE to the students in schools, including breakfast served before school, breakfast served in the classroom, lunch, after school snacks, and after school supper. Again, these are Councilmember Drum and Councilmember Kalos. I'll ask our chair of the Education Committee, Drum, to say a few words, and then Councilmember Kalos. Thank you, Speaker Mark Viverito, for elevating an issue near and dear to my heart. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, or questioning, and gender nonconforming students. Resolution 1442A calls upon the DOE to provide curricular and other supports to protect LGBTQ students and to ensure that administrators, teachers, and students in all middle and high schools are informed that under federal law, students have a right to convene and participate in gender sexuality alliances or GSAs. GSAs and other supportive structures that explicitly address sexual orientation and gender identity are not only critical lifelines to vulnerable LGBTQ students, but also improve the overall school climate. While there are exemplary schools, there are too few. Every school must have a structure in place that addresses the needs of LGBTQ students and that educates everyone else. It is wonderful to see students leading programs, but ultimately it is up to the adults to initiate and encourage efforts. I want to thank Jan Atwell for all her work on this. I also want to give special thanks to my colleague and straight super ally, Ben Kalos, whose companion legislation <laughs> requires much needed reporting on GSAs. And I mean that very seriously. We in the LGBT rights movement need to have our super straight allies. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Danny. That is very kind. Uh, thank you, Speaker Mark Viverito. Um, if you haven't heard by now, I'll introduce legislation for residents who participate in a monthly town hall we do called Brainstorming with Ben. And along these lines, I'm proud to have worked with uh, Danny Drum, who has been a tireless fighter for LGBTQ rights as a teacher and now as education chair on introduction 1638 uh, with the students of Eastside Middle School in my district and the Manhattan Student Leadership Council. I just want to acknowledge uh, four of them, Ananya Roy, Chloe Shasimo, Katerina Kaur, and Neil Sarkar, among many other students to require reporting on gender sexuality alliances in public middle and high schools as well as teachers and administrators trained on supporting them. With the incident in the Bronx, we witnessed what the worst of bullying can do, not just to the bullied and the bullies, but to other students, families, and the whole community. We have a lot of work to do to address bullying in our schools, and our chair led an amazing hearing on that on Monday. For LGBTQ students, GSAs often provide those safe spaces. According to the NYPD, hate crimes have doubled since last year with anti-transgender incidents cited as a major cause. Gender Sexuality Alliances are student-led organizations that bring together LGBTQ students with allies to provide safe space to meet, have discussions, offer support, and plan events and activities. According to Advocates for Children of New York, the presence of a GSA in a school decreases anti-LGBTQ bullying and harassment and makes students feel safer and more comfortable. Uh, and uh, just speaking to uh, the school food bill that we're doing, no public school child should go hungry in one of the wealthiest cities in the world. With the recent announcement of universal free school lunch that followed our speaker's pledge in the state of the city, no child will have to worry about affording lunch or lunch shaming. But now we need to learn how many children are actually eating the school meals. Thanks to a partnership with Lunch for Learning campaign under the leadership of Liz Ackles at Community Food Advocates, under introduction 773B, the Department of Education will set goals for increasing participation and report on how many children actually eat breakfast before or after the bell, lunch, snacks, and supper. Thank you.
Uh, continuing our work to improve safety standards on construction sites around the city, the council will be voting on introduction 1307A, sponsored by Housing and Buildings Chair Germani Williams, which would specify qualifications for Department of Buildings inspectors, and introduction 1436A, sponsored by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, which we require the DOB to report on site safety manager and coordinator certificates, the number of sites which were required a site safety manager or co coordinator, the number of certificates issued, the number of applications filed, the average time for approval of an application, and the average time for a completion of the background check. Again, Council Member Williams chairs the Housing Buildings Committee and will say a few words. And, oh, he came dressed up too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, Wonder Woman. Yes. Right? yes. Ah. <laughs> NHL 1307A does change the requirements for hiring building inspectors. The bill will enable the DOB to hire more inspectors, which is essential to cover the ever-growing expanse of buildings in our city. Uh, the commissioner and the entire Department of Buildings explained some of the issues they had in hiring uh, inspectors. All new hires must complete a thorough 12-week training process with DOB once they've been hired. This expands the talent pool without compromising our high standards for scrutiny and safety. After the hearing, um, there was some concerns about all the inspectors being changed. We listened to those concerns by uh, experts in the industry. And we, it keeps in place existing language now because of the hearing for those handling inspectors dealing with medical and natural gas piping systems, backflow prevention, electrical work, and others. Uh, so I just want to make clear anything that was directly related to safety, uh, we made sure that those uh, inspectors the requirements remain stringent and difficult. The things that we're talking about are people who can go in and make sure that a house is vacant or make sure that a curb cut has been remedied. Those type of inspectors are what we are uh, talking about, not inspectors, again, that are directly connected uh, to the safety and very important construction work that needs to be done. We think this will help move things uh, much faster. The public is, uh, the, the public does have a right for all of their the, all the things they apply from the DOB to move expeditiously, that was not happening. Uh, DOB was unable to uh, hire up in places that they needed to. Uh, we're doing things like moving uh, for someone to be able to uh, check to see if a house is vacated. You may not need five years of experience, and it goes down to something like two years of experience. So uh, a lot of uh, work was put into this. I want to thank the speaker again. We made effort to make sure we did this uh, without compromising any safety. Thank you. Next, Council will vote on intro 1066A, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Espinal, which would require the Department of Homeless Services to maintain a record of all unsheltered homeless persons who are receiving services from or have been contacted by outreach staff. And introduction 1443A, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, which would require training for certain staff working in DHS shelters and HRA HASA facilities in administering naloxone also known as Narcan, to individuals who have overdosed on opioids. The bill would also require that training be made available to residents of those facilities and that such facilities must have at least one trained staff member on duty at all times. Uh, Council Member Torres is not uh, here to join us. I want to thank him for his bill and sincerely uh, hit, uh, thank him for his attention to this issue and we'll hear from Espinal on, do you pass on this one? Okay. Uh, Next, the Council will vote on Introduction 1316A, sponsored by Economic Development Chair Dan Gorodnik, which would require New York City Economic Development Corporation to submit fiscal impact statements to the Speaker for every covered project receiving city assistance. And Introduction 1337A, sponsored by Contracts Chair Helen Rosenthal, which would require that NYC EDC submit a project description and budget for covered economic projects to the Speaker for review and commit comments at least 30 days before holding a public hearing on the project or for projects which do not require a public hearing before the project agreement is executed. And intro 1322A, sponsored by Council Member Corey Johnson, which would require NYC EDC to report on efforts made to recover financial assistance provided to projects which default on the material terms of the project agreement under which such assistance was provided. Uh, Council members Rosenthal and Johnson are not here to join us, but I'm going to ask our chair of the Economic Development Committee, Dan Goronik, to speak on his and uh, the other bills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I am very pleased that we're voting on these three bills that we passed out of the Economic Development Committee. 
they will ensure that the public gets a clear picture of how the city is doling out funds for economic development. Every dollar that we spend on economic development incentives should have a clear purpose. And we should have the information we need to ensure that that purpose is being met. Earlier this year, the New York City Economic Development Corporation reported 554 active projects receiving city investments at a cost of $1.8 billion to taxpayers. As a comparison, this is more than the budget for the Department of Homeless Services and the Parks Department combined in fiscal year 2017. That's not to say that these investments do not have very laudable goals. They, they do. Without question, EDC investments create new jobs, expand affordable housing, improve the quality of neighborhoods throughout the five boroughs, and refurbish sites of historic and cultural significance. But too often, these important projects are undertaken with very little public consultation or awareness. It's not always clear where our public dollars go and whether or not these investments are actually achieving their intended objectives. This needs to change. We must assure New Yorkers that they're getting the best bang for their buck when it comes to these programs. My bill 1316 will require EDC to submit fiscal impact statements in advance of each project financed for the, for the purpose of creating jobs or other economic development. We believe that this bill will provide us with a clear and open understanding of the expectations and collateral effects of EDC projects. Councilmember Johnson's bill, intro 1322, would require public reporting on the city's efforts to claw back financial assistance from projects that do not meet their job creation or other economic development obligations. And Councilmember Rosenthal's bill, 1337, would require EDC to submit project descriptions and budgets for public review and comment prior to the execution of an economic development contract. It's our responsibility to ensure that city funds are being spent effectively. There should be no obscurity around public spending. We need to know exactly what EDC is planning to spend, what they expect to accomplish with that spending, and how they plan to enforce their expectations. So I want to thank uh, the speaker and my colleagues, especially Council Members Helen Rosenthal and Corey Johnson, um, Committee Council Alex Polinoff, of course, thank you, uh, and everyone else who committed their time and energy to this effort, and I very much look forward to passing these bills today. So thank you very much. Thank you. On green issues, the Council will be voting on intro 1638, sponsored by Council Member Lori Combo, which would require the city, in conjunction with CUNY, to develop a plan um, for encouraging voluntary solar energy energy used by city employees, and intro 1639A, sponsored by Council Member Peter Ku, which would require the city in conjunction with CUNY to develop a plan for encouraging voluntary solar energy use in business improvement districts. And intro 1644A, sponsored by Council Member Donovan Richards, which would create an office of alternative energy responsible for establishing a program to assist with an, and streamlining review of alternative energy projects and coordinating with other agencies to ensure that policies are in place, encouraging the installation and maintenance of alternative energy products. Uh, Council Member Combo is still enjoying time with her newborn mm -hmm. on maternity leave, and so obviously she will not be here with us today, but I want to thank her for her bill, and I want to invite Council Member Ku and Donovan Richards to explain and give brief remarks on their bills. Thank you, Speaker. Today I'm asking my colleagues to join me Sorry, yeah. Today, I'm asking my colleagues to join me in supporting intro 1639A to promote and increase in solar energy use within business improvement districts. This bill will create a plan to encourage the voluntary use of solar power within BIDs by facilitating new strategies for both purchasing installation and sharing of solar within BIDs. Uh, the upfront causes of going solar can be daunting, which is why establish, establishing bold discounts can encourage cost savings for our city's 64 BIDs, while also providing them with new and sustainable energy alternatives. Solar power is the future of sustainable energy, and as a city, we must be sure that this 
in-demand technology uh, is ob obtainable by our small businesses. This is a unique way as a city can continue uh, our push to incentivize uh, green industries while at the same time supporting our mom and pop uh, businesses. Thank you, Speaker Riverito, for your support and leadership. And I encourage my, lead, uh, my colleagues to join me in passing uh, today's uh, this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm proud to stand here to continue our work in the council on ensuring that uh, this city leads the charge on climate change while our federal government rolls back the progress our country has made through commitments such as the Paris Climate Accord. I'm sure anyone, as our Housing and Buildings Chair said earlier, who's dealt with the Department of Buildings can attest that their response is slow and there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy in that agency. That's why intro 1644A aims to speed up the progress for applications that incorporate green energy components with the creation of the Office of Alternative Energy. This office would provide guidance to applicants, coordinate with agencies to ensure that policies are in place to encourage the installation and maintenance of green project, projects and make recommendations to the Commissioner of Buildings and the heads of other agencies to streamline the approval process. Currently, the Department of Building has an employee who focuses on solar projects. But under this new office, projects that involve wind, geothermal, and any other alternative energy will be expedited. While this council has done so much to address the environment and the impacts on climate change, the hurricanes that struck Houston, Florida, and Puerto Rico over the last few months show us that there's still a lot more work that needs to be done to prepare our cities for the next natural disaster. Now's the time for us to kick it up a notch by providing green energy incentives as, meant, as much as possible. I'd like to thank our Housing and Buildings Chair, Jamani Williams, Committee Council Ed Atkin, and my Legislative uh, Director, Jordan Gibbons, and the Speaker for her leadership in this area. Okay, prompted by the case of Nunez versus City of New York, the Council will be voting on intro 778A, sponsored by Council Member Rosie Mendez, which would establish permanent reporting on disciplinary actions taken against Department of Correction officers, aggregating all actions into a yearly report, including data on investigations into the use of force and the speed and disciplinary outcomes of these investigations. I want to thank Council Member Mendez for that. Moving on, the Council will vote on intro 1379A, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, which would explicitly prohibit discrimination in public contracting by making it unlawful for a city agency to deny a contract based on actual or perceived race, creed, color, national origin, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, alienage, or citizenship status of the owners of the bidder or proposer, and by enabling a bidder or proposer who believes they have been discriminated against by a city agency, selecting a contract to protest the agency's determination via rules established by the Procurement Policy Board. Thank Council Member Richard uh, Torres for that. Uh, and exciting news for residents and business owners, uh, and obviously you've been receiving a lot of attention on this <laughs> bill. Uh, the council will be voting on intro 1652A, sponsored by Councilor Affairs Chair Rafael Espinal, which would repeal the New York City Cabaret Law of 1926, but retain crucial security measures vital to more modern nightlife establishments. I want to congratulate uh, Council Member Espinal, who has really been shepherding this bill for some time, and uh, I'm glad we've arrived at this point, and I'm gonna say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I really wanna thank you for helping me facilitate this. I really appreciate all your support on this bill as well. So, you know, the, the speaker mentioned this is, this is a law that's been kept in the books for a very long time. It's historically notorious, and, but what we're doing here is repealing that law, but also keeping the security measures in place to protect patrons in nice life establishments. For those of you who don't know what the cabaret law is, it requires businesses to apply for a license to allow New Yorkers to dance. Today's vote represents a continuation of my efforts to improve the regulation of the nightlife industry. Many of us can agree that the city's cabaret law is outdated and unresponsive and has only get gotten in the way of New Yorkers' ability to fully express themselves, even pushing dancing into the underground and unsafe and unregulated spaces. From its inception in 1926, the cabaret law has been used to target particular establishments and has been enforced and it has been enforced unevenly, at times in a manner that was prejudiced. 
if you're Latino, if you're black, if you're from the LGBTQ community, you all have been impacted by this law. It is a time we right this historical wrong and remove New York City's inappropriate and arbitrarily enforced dancing license. By repealing the cabaret law, we're moving towards decriminalizing dancing in New York City. No longer will businesses have to live in fear of the cabaret law being arbitrarily used against them. We acknowledge that this issue goes beyond the license and that reforms to zoning laws are also necessary. But I'm confident that the changes we are implementing today are a move in the right direction. This bill represents decades of advocacy in partnership with a coalition of folks who want to improve the quality of nightlife and increase cultural spaces. Covering questions about the viability of the city's nightlife are hampering New York City's cultural reputation and has erased a lot of our city's history by closing beloved venues, especially during the Giuliani administration. We have been thinking progressively about new ideas to plan our city so that nightlife goers, artists, local residents, and government can all communicate and live in harmony which is why back in August 24th, we passed the bill to create the Office of Nightlife and the Nightlife Advisory Board so they can continue the task of updating many of our laws in order to restore and enhance the city's nighttime culture and economy. If the city does not take these steps to repeal or significantly modernize our approach to nightlife venues, we will continue to stifle New York City's cultural and artistic development and overburden these businesses with unnecessary red tape. I am proud to champion this historic bill, which will right a 91-year-old historic wrong and take this progressive action to support culture in our city. I want to thank all the advocates. I want to thank Dance Liberation Network, New York City Artist Coalition, Dance Parade, New York City Hospitality Alliance, House Coalition, Local 802, and all the business owners who gave us so much information. I want to thank the committee staff, Rachel Cordero, Valkis Mirig, and Israel Martinez, as well as my own staff, Rick Arbello, and Erica Tanner, and Lloyd Lesperance for all the work they've done to get this done. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rabbi. <coughs> A majority of Americans believe that having a gun in their home makes them safer. I'm not one of them. As numerous studies have conclusively demonstrated, the opposite is true. The risk of suicide is higher in homes with guns. The risk of homicide is higher in homes where an abusive partner owns a gun. And occupants are significantly more likely to die from accidental gunshot injuries in homes with guns. As we have seen time and time again across this country, Firearm reform must be taken seriously at every level and in every jurisdiction. Here in New York City, that means doing everything in our power to make our citizens safer. Today, the council will be voting on two resolutions and one bill, which we believe will do to firearm ownership what cigarette warnings have done for tobacco consumption by igniting a national movement to educate the public on associated risks. First, introduction 1724A, sponsored by myself and Public Safety Chair Vanessa Gibson would require the NYPD to provide applicants for firearm licenses and permits with a warning pertaining to the increased risk of suicide, unintentional death, and death during domestic disputes in households with firearms. And resolutions 1676, 77 of, of 2017, which oppose HR 367 uh, and accompanied uh, Senate Bill 59 known as the Hearing Protection Act of 2017, how cynical is that name, and HR 38 and related Bill S446 known as the Constitutional Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act of 2017. Additionally, introduction 1569A, also sponsored by Public Safety Chair Vanessa Gibson, which would create an alternative to the state's disorderly conduct statute, which would have a maximum punishment of five days, thus creating an additional tool for law enforcement, judges, and prosecutors to make sure that the punishment matches the crime. This bill will also help reduce the risk that a low-level offense will trigger negative collateral consequences, including those related to immigration benefits. This bill was announced in my February 2017 State of the City Address and builds upon this council session's legacy of criminal justice reform. Uh, and as I am joined by co-sponsor Vanessa Gibson, I invite her to speak on these essential issues. Council member. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon to all my colleagues. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm truly honored to stand here as the chair of public safety and certainly want to commend our speaker for her tireless advocacy, for her strong leadership, and truly affirming this council's priority, our passion to protect every New Yorker in this city. It is estimated today that over one third of our city's residents are foreign born, representing one of the highest immigrant populations among US cities. Simply put, without immigrants, we have no New York City. Diversion and diversity and inclusion have always been hallmarks of our great nation. Unfortunately, we have a federal administration 
that does not share our views of inclusivity and is threatening to pull our fabric apart. That is why we want every New Yorker to know and we want to make it clear that regardless of where you were born, the zip code you live in in our city, we stand in solidarity to protect the rights of each and every one of our New Yorkers. It is absolutely possible and indeed it is necessary to protect the rights of immigrants without compromising public safety. It can and is happening. In New York City, we know that these two goals are not mutually exclusive. Deportations can tear apart families and destabilize our growing communities. This does not make our city safer. In fact, it makes the NYPD's job even more challenging. That is why I am so proud to prime sponsor intro 1569 relating to prohibiting disorderly behavior. The passage of this legislation will ensure that low-level nonviolent offenses do not trigger negative immigration consequences. This legislation will create an administrative code offense that is an alternative to the state's disorderly conduct statute and would carry a maximum penalty of no more than five days in jail. This legislation would give more options to our prosecutors in resolving many of their cases. Creating this city offense alternative will not only help our immigrant community, but truly all New Yorkers, and is certainly in line with this council's goal of creating proportional penalties for low-level and nonviolent offenses. I am also proud to join with our speaker in co-sponsoring resolutions and legislation that relates to common sense gun control. Practically every day in this country, someone is killed and or injured by gun violence. Despite this being an almost everyday occurrence, our federal lawmakers refuse to take sensible action. That's not right. We in New York City have one of the strongest gun laws in this nation, and we must do everything possible to continue to pass common sense legislation. We must also stand firm in opposing any harmful federal legislation that will make New Yorkers less safe and undermine our efforts to protect this city. Proposed intro 1724A relates to requiring the NYPD to disclose gun violence information to applicants for firearm licenses and permits. Resolution number 1676, which opposes the federal legislation known as the Hearing Protection Act of 2017 and proposed Reso 1677A, which opposes federal legislation known as the Conceal to Carry Reciprocity, sorry, Act of 2017 are critical to the safety of our city and I truly urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation. I really want to thank the speaker for her leadership, her dedication, her tireless efforts to criminal justice reform, and truly her defense of all immigrants and their rights. I'd also like to thank the public safety legal team, my, my amazing staff of Deepa Ambakar, Beth Golub, Steve Reister, Casey Addison, my chief of staff, Dana Wax. Also want to thank Indiana Porter, Kelly Taylor, and Brian Crow for their tremendous assistance on intro 1569. I'm looking forward to passing these resolves to affirm our commitment to let our federal legislators know that we are not playing when it comes to keeping this city safe. And I thank all of my colleagues on the Public Safety Committee, and I'm looking forward to passing this legislation today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And closing out the day, the council will vote on a package of bills first announced at my February State of the City address that protect the rights of immigrants and help to support our immigrant communities. Indiscriminate immigration enforcement and the threat of mass deportation undermines the public safety, stability, and the economic growth we have fought so hard to provide for New Yorkers. It results in confusion and fear that extends beyond the individual immigrant. It affects their U.S. citizen and permanent resident spouses, children, parents, and employers. We will continue to work along with federal agencies when there is a genuine threat to public safety. But we will not waste city resources to help immigration authorities destroy our families, our communities, and the safety that we have fought so hard to achieve in this city. So up first, my bill, Introduction 1558A, 
co-sponsored by Council Member Julissa Ferreras Copeland, would expand the city's detainer laws, which prevent the Department of Correction and NYPD from honoring requests from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, except in limited circumstances, by placing similar restrictions on the Department of Probation. Next, introduction 1568A, sponsored by Council Members Rafael Espinal, would restrict uh, the use of city resources to support the enforcement of civil immigration laws, civil immigration laws, and laws that penalize a person's presence, entry, or reentry into the United States. Under the bill, city employees will be banned from spending time on duty or using city property or information obtained by the city to support such immigration enforcement. The bill also prohibits law enforcement from entering into formal partnerships with ICE through, that, uh, through PACs that are known as 287G agreements. The bill would also expand upon existing NYPD and DOC reporting requirements relating to detainer holds issued by, CI, um, by ICE to cover requests for information and informal transfers of custody. An introduction six, uh, 1565A, sponsored by Education Chair Danny Drum, which would require DOE to annually distribute information related to students' and parents' educational rights and the DOE's policies and procedures related to interactions with non-local law enforcement, including information about relevant legal resources, and would also require the DOE to notify any student and their parents if non-local law enforcement requests access to student or the student records. And finally, today, we also will be calling on an extension of temporary protective status for the 10 countries currently designated for TPS on account of the devastating environmental disasters, ongoing armed conflict, and extraordinary and temporary conditions that prevent its nationals from returning safely. We're joined today by Immigration Committee Chair and Resolution 6038 co-sponsor Carlos Menchaca. I want to invite him to kick off to address all of the issues that fall uh, in this package. Uh, and then I'll ask Espinal, Council Member Espinal and Council Member Drum uh, to then say a few words as well. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the entire Committee on Immigration for unanimously passing every single bill that will be coming to the floor. Um, you heard today, even outside of the Immigration Committee, the work that uh, Council Member Gibson is doing in her committee. The work that we're doing right now in the sanctuary movement is dynamic. And so everything that we're doing right now is in response to our commitment to ensuring that everyone feels welcome. New Yorkers and the values that we have in our city are about lifting everyone up and that everyone is welcome. And that means that this is not just a New York value, this is for our nation, our states, our cities, and our neighborhoods. And which is why the TPS resolution is such an important one right now. 10 countries will be losing that opportunity to stay in our neighborhoods. These are people that we represent in our neighborhood. I wanna make sure that we also honor the work that our speaker has been pushing right now and making sure that the detainer, the detainer laws and that spirit about law are now moving into corrections and probation. And then finally, to ensure that we are not using any city resources to advance the xenophobic and dangerous things that are coming down from the federal government will now be placed into law. This is a proud moment for this uh, committee and we are gonna continue as a committee uh, and as a council to ensuring that sanctuary, the dynamic promise that we have made continues. Thank you. Thank you again, Madam Speaker, for taking the lead on so many important immigration issues here in the city of New York and for working with me to respond to 45's nativist rhetoric, which is sadly being translated into xenophobic policy. We have been looking at every way we as a city committee committed to resistance can help the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Throughout this country, there have been an increasing number of horror stories of non-local law enforcement, including immigration and customs enforcement, preying on children and their parents at places that should be safe spaces, namely hospitals, schools, and courthouses. To illustrate the gravity of the situation, I'm going to quote the Buffalo Field Office Director for ICE, who has ominously announced that everyone is fair game. Intro 1565A will help schools deal with the crisis by reinforcing our school's commitment to serve all students, including recent immigrant and mixed status families. This legislation requires the DOE to annually distribute 
valuable information related to students' and parents' educational rights and the DOE's policies and procedures related to interactions with non-local law enforcement. The legislation also requires the DOE to notify any student whose directory information may be released pursuant to federal statute, what information may be released, and to whom and how students or their parents may opt out. If non-local law enforcement tries to access a student or a student's records, the DOE would be required to notify the student's parents and provide information to the student and student's parent about available resources seeking legal assistance. I believe these measures help maintain the integrity of our schools and thus confidence of immigrant parents and students. And finally, I want to acknowledge Immigration Committee Chair Carlos Menchaca for his collaboration on all immigration-related and Education Committee Council Samita Desmuk for her work on this particular bill. Thank you very much. I simply just want to give a big, big thank you to Speaker Mark uh, Reverito for all the work she's done on behalf of immigrants. You know, when I supported her for Speaker, uh, one of the major reasons I did that is because she was a steadfast supporter from the beginning. She, she helped push that law a few years ago uh, to make sure that ICE is not cooperating, uh, that the Department of um, Corrections is not cooperating with ICE. She went even further uh, a few years ago to, to make sure that we're not cooperating at all. And now we're, 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 we're taking a serious stance and saying that New York is a sanctuary city. We're not going to help federal authorities uh, find uh, immigrants in this, in this city uh, that are no threat to, to the residents of, of New York City. So I'm really proud to have worked on this bill with her as, Dominic as a son of Dominican immigrants and as a family member of people who are undocumented in this country. I have seen the negative effects of uh, immigration laws and I can say that uh, with the federal government and the behavior they're acting now, it's going to have a detrimental uh, impact on a lot of our families. But I'm proud to say that New York City is taking the lead and making sure we're protecting as many families as we can. Thank you, Madam Thank Speaker. You so much. Uh, uh, I know we've been joined by Councilmember Steve Levin, who has the Pfizer project in his district. He's voting on that today. He wants to say a few words. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and, uh, and her staff uh, at, uh, at, at the Central Staff and Land Use Division. I want to thank uh, the subcommittee chair, Donovan Richards, and the full Land Use Committee chair, uh, David Greenfield, um, for ensuring that this, uh, that this project, which is uh, a mandatory inclusionary project, um, will be a balanced project. It will uh, uh, have hundreds of units of affordable housing, uh, uh, open space, uh, good paying uh, jobs, um, and community involvement as it moves forward. Um, and that, uh, and that this, this project in, in a lot of ways is an affirmation of the mandatory inclusionary housing program that we voted on last year, uh, which mandates that developers in this instance do 25% of the units uh, at 60% of AMI and 40% of AMI, which is going to meet the real need of affordable housing uh, in the communities surrounding the area, in Community Board 1 and Community Board 3 in Brooklyn, um, this was a, 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 a vigorous process, vigorous, de vigorous debate, um, and uh, through that debate and through the process, I think the project became a better project, and so I want to thank again the speaker uh, as well as uh, all of my colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso expressed concerns, and I think that we worked to address uh, a lot of those concerns, uh, and as, as I said, uh, uh, the subcommittee chair, Donovan Richards, uh, full committee chair, David Greenfield, and of course, the speaker, Melissa Mark Rivera. Thank you. A couple of words in Spanish. Um, hoy el Consejo votará para nombrar conjuntamente 70 vías públicas y lugares públicos en toda la ciudad. También votaremos para cambiar la zonificación de varios lugares, entre ellos eh, lo que tiene que ver el proyecto que mencionó Steve Levin, de Pfizer, y parte de Linden Boulevard, ambos proyectos ubicados en Brooklyn. Con respecto a las escuelas de la ciudad, el Consejo va a votar para aumentar la transparencia sobre el apoyo a los estudiantes LGBTQ y de género no conforme y para informar sobre las comidas que se les proporcionan a los estudiantes en la escuela pública. Además, el Consejo votará para desarrollar planes para la promoción del uso voluntario de energía solar por distritos de mejora comerciales y empleados de la ciudad y para crear una oficina de energía alternativa. Después, el Consejo votará para derogar la ley de cabaret de la ciudad de Nueva York que está en vigencia desde 1926 y finalmente el Consejo va a votar 
sobre legislación para enmendar ciertas prácticas de la ciudad relacionadas con la inmigración y la imposición de la ley de inmigración y para exigir la distribución de materiales de advertencia de lesiones a solicitantes para la licencia de armas de fuego y de permisos. Uh, so that's your quick, 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 quick summary in Spanish, and we will take some questions. I mean, I think we, you know, we've been very explicitly clear, and I think <laughs> that the fear was always uh, someone like Trump uh, coming into some sort of power. And now as occupi occupant of the White House, you know, our fears have been met. And so we are the safest city by far in the country, uh, and we have been able to achieve that with having policies in place which affirm inclusion and infer, you know, and, and affirm uh, the support to our immigrant communities, regardless of their status, because we know that the vast majority um, are here uh, contributing positively. So that narrative that the federal government puts out that um, immigrants, whether you're, whether you're documented or not, but immigrants in general are rapists and are violent, uh, has not been, you know, obviously we have demonstrated that, that that is not the case, obviously, in the city of New York, and it's not the case in reality. We want to make sure that we continue to put policies in place that continue to reaffirm our values uh, and to codify to the extent that we can. So looking at what is happening nationally, where these ICE agents, they are eliminating certain requirements in terms of them being eligible and being able to be hired, uh, basically dumbing it down, so to speak, right? We have um, them being given uh, uh, basically carte blanche to pick up anybody wherever. Places that we were considered were safe spaces before uh, are now being, are not safe spaces. We have them in our immigration, we've seen them in courts, in our court systems, outside traffic, human trafficking, uh, domestic violence courts. Uh, we now have the case of that 10 year old young girl with cerebral palsy mm -hmm. getting you know, operated in a hospital and they're basically wheeling her out, they're in the hospital wheeling her out. I mean, this is atrocious, what is happening. Uh, so if anyone thinks that they're being discriminate in terms of looking for only people that pose a harm to society, clearly that is not the case. So we want to continue to codify and affirm our values and to the extent that we can, we're implementing laws. So our laws are very clear. Uh, that we are not going to use city resources in any sort of uh, civil immigration enforcement. And that's what we're doing through the series of, of, of legislation and basically saying that we won't engage in these kinds of uh, agreements, which basically would, if I'm not mistaken, the 287G is the one that basically, uh, you know, authorizes local authorities to share information, et cetera, or to act as uh, immigration enforcement agents. We're just codifying it, you know, our position and saying that no city resources will be used in any way to enforce federal immigration policies. That's basically bottom line what we're doing here. And I, I'm very proud of the record of this council. And we have incredibly strong support, uh, almost unanimous in, in these positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm going to be leaving this council very proud of the extended work, which I'm hoping other cities, other municipalities will also look to uh, replicate. Hopefully that answers your question. We have been in dialogue, very recent dialogue, with advocates, uh, with the police department, with the sponsors of the bill. There's been a, a lot of conversation, and so we are still going through our process with those bills. Can you repeat the question? We are going through the process with those bills.
No, those are two separate actions. I, you know, and if I can speak to it, uh, zoning regulates where they can be placed, you know, where certain establishments can be placed. And this is basically lifting the requirement of having to have a license in order for people to be able to dance. Uh, and we, you know, we hear, we hear horror stories from small business owners of how the law has been used against them, right? And uh, if certain community boards can't go after an establishment uh, by taking away their liquor license, they may decide to implement other laws um, in a way that it wasn't originally intention. So, you know, those concerns here. So we heard about all that and uh, reasons why we're at this point today. So I, I just want to make it clear, in order for you to be able to get a cabaret license, you have to have all of your permits in place in order to just for you to operate the business. The license just technically says you're allowed to allow people to dance in your business. So you still need to follow the fire code, you have to follow the noise code, you have to follow the building code. So all those things are still in place. It doesn't change anything. It's just another uh, bureaucratic red tape put in place for to, um, a lot that pushes businesses to spend more money, more lawyers, more architects, and more issues. So we're getting rid of that. Um, what was the second question? So, so how do you know what the actual permits that you're supposed to have? I mean, they get made on a regular basis. Well, they so so er that? everybody pays the money to comply with it. Uh, what they, what the people who don't have the cabaret license and the people who do, the only difference is paying the fee to get the license and going through the process of getting that license. What's so the number? I'm not sure. What's the number? The fee for the license, the cabaret license. 200? Between two hundred and nine hundred dollars, they have to pay. So no longer they will have to pay uh, that fee to the city of New York. Also, it was used as a way to go after the liquor license and revoke the liquor license for businesses. So even though a business will receive a fine for allowing dancing and it might get tossed out in court, the the uh, state liquor authority will still use that citation as a way to put pressure on the business and make them pay even more thousands of dollars just to be able to obtain the liquor license again. So you're All of that is gone. Right. right. Well, whenever it gets yeah. signed into by mm -hmm. the mayor, yeah. And I don't know what the date of effect is. 30 days, 90 days. 30 days. Okay, so I'm not a lawyer, but I, this is what I understand, and they can go into more detail, right? Right now, without what we're doing, Right now you have up to 15 days. Um, just by the fact, even if you don't, you're not sitting in Rikers for, for the 15 days, even if you sit for five days, just the fact that the law states up to 15 days triggers other collateral damage to anybody, you know, even people that are, these are primarily obviously nonviolent, low level offenses. So it could trigger and have collateral consequences. <coughs> what those are, the lawyers can give you examples, but in having now this new disorderly conduct clause or the, up to five days, it does not trigger. Um, the same collateral consequences that, that having up to 15 days language and provision does. So we can give you some, you know, we can talk to the lawyers and give you examples exactly what that could trigger. And in par particularly with immigrant communities, it could have some adverse impacts with regards to DACA, you know, or other applications uh, that you may be applying for, or uh, applications uh, that you may be filling out, and permits or per permissions that you may be asking for. They may not allow you to do that. It's an additional tool that's also available to the prosecutors and to the DAs. Okay. Yeah. But it's basically also the same thing that happened with the we'll get more we'll get we'll get you the specifics. I think so, yes. I think we just want to get all the different agencies that have any sort of interaction with law enforcement to follow the same thing. We did this with, uh, we started off with Department of Corrections, obviously, in Rikers. 
it went, went to NYPD afterwards. And so we just want any, all, all the agencies that fall under the category of having, a, a, dealing with people that have been jailed or imprisoned to have to follow the same criteria. So we just wanted to base it more, make it more uniform. I believe it, yes, it is, yes, yes. Yeah, we wanted to mimic what the others had been doing. We're talking about specifically city employees, okay? So those that we pay, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we do what we can, <laughs> right? So we don't have the authority to tell uh, state employees what to do. Well, it's a law. It's not going to be a law, and now it is going to be the law of the land of the city of New York that city employees cannot. Uh, so if anyone is found to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, going against the law, then there'll be consequences to that. But the expectation is that people would adhere uh, to what it is that we're in. This is, again, something that has been done in consultation with the administration, and we have uh, an agreement, and we all believe in this. It's, is, you know, basically uh, policies that we've been speaking to and supporting for years between us and the, and, the, and the mayor. So the expectation is that all city employees will follow that, yes. So I'm, so I'm extremely uh, focused on obviously the next two months and I'm getting uh, as much policy in place and implemented. And obviously the US attorney uh, decided not to prosecute and I will defer to their judgment. 